Welcome to Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman, the only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. Hello, Bart. How are you today? Well, I'm I'm doing better. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a lot, rough, rough uh, few, last few weeks, and uh, so thank yeah. you for uh, having a uh, filling in with uh, James Tabor, my friend and uh, uh, expert uh, on the New Testament and early Christianity, and all around interesting fellow. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. And oh, it was uh, a lot of fun. Oh, good, 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 good. Okay, so uh, yeah, it's been a bit of a roller coaster, and you know, that's kind of how life goes sometimes. <laughs> so, but we're we're yeah. back in the swing here. How how, how are you doing? Yeah, good. Actually, uh, my multitude of children are all finally healthy. My voice is mostly back. So that's always helpful when you spend most of your time recording podcasts. Uh, A yeah, right. little so, bit of a problem if my voice goes. So, um, you know, I, uh, part of this is I'd like to hear more about you. <laughs> so okay. uh, so I, some people comment. So I was in I was in England, as you know, for a, a couple of weeks uh, for other things and uh, for a family thing, and uh, at, I had I had some I met some people there who had listened to the bot podcast and they're all interested in like uh, you, <laughs> but, but it's funny, like uh, they were they were saying to me what so uh, right a, a seriology what, how does somebody get interested in a seriology <laughs> I, I think I think good. earlier we talked about what it was but like how did yeah. you know it's not the sort of thing you think you know. Uh, you're not learning about it in like grade school or something. So how do you? Right. Right. Oh, it, it, and that's that's honestly a personal, um, a personal. It's my soapbox, really. We should learn more about Mesopotamia far earlier. And the U.S. actually does it better because my two eldest children uh, have actually had some information about Mesopotamia from their grade school social studies classes. Huh. Uh, we didn't get that when I was going through school in the U.K. Um, and actually, I started out as a junior baby classicist. I did classics in high school, and then I had a brief one-year foray into a jewellery and silver, silversmithing undergraduate degree, and then um, sat through uh, like the introductory lecture with my sister at a university open day for an ancient history program, and essentially thought, what on earth am I doing with my life? This is where I need to be. Well, so I switched universities, switched degrees, and did ancient history instead, and loved every second. But the program I was in was a very broad one. So we did classics, Greek and Roman, we did Egyptian history, and we did um, Mesopotamian history. And I all through that wanted to be a classicist. I love Greek mythology. Uh, it's kind of just always been uh, something I, I really enjoy. But my, the advisor for my undergraduate thesis was an historiologist, a wonderful man called Alistair Livingston. And he essentially, over several cups of tea, very gently steered me into a seriology because, um, in his words, all of the stuff in classics has already been discovered and translated. And we have so much stuff in a seriology still to be discovered and still to be translated. And, and we need people like you to do that work. So that's kind of how I got into it. And obviously I'm not um, not really doing an awful lot in the way of discovery and translation, but I'm trying to um, do the work of bringing a seriology to yes. the general public who don't really know what it is because we do an awful job of publicizing it. Yeah, okay, well, good. So we're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna wanna hear more about that because <laughs> <laughs> it, it wasn't something I learned in school either. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, uh, although of course I've got friends who are seri seriologists, mm -hmm. but you know, that's what, you know, that's what happens when you're a nerdy biblical scholar, you have friends who are seri yeah, who yeah. read cuneiform and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, okay. So yes, I love it. It's, it's yeah. a wonderful field. Um, uh, and I feel very lucky. Yeah, okay. We should probably get into our discussion yeah. for the day, because yeah. I'll happily sit here and talk about seriology for the next <laughs> hour. But um, the podcast is not called a seriology with Megan's. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, maybe, yeah, okay. Also, 
Uh, today we're looking at women in the New Testament and the early church, so things like what restrictions were placed on them because of their sex. Does the New Testament give an accurate depiction of how women actually lived and functioned within the early church? And should the New Testament be used as a guide for women's participation in modern churches? So I think maybe to start, Bart, why do you think the role of women in the early church is something that is worth discussing? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's certainly worth discussing because of the issues today. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, we have a, uh, the largest denomination in the world is the Roman Catholic Church and women are not allowed to be priests. Um, you know, and I'm not, I'm lo not looking for a woman pope anytime soon. And there are a number of uh, Protestant denominations that still uh, maintain that women uh, are not to be uh, in leadership roles, in a significant, in significant leadership roles. And a lot of people, even in liberal denominations, sometimes feel a little bit uneasy with a, a senior pastor who's a, who's a woman. And you wonder, well, why is that exactly? You know, um, is it, you know, uh, do, the, do these people really think that women are inferior, uh, that they can't be as spiritual as, or, or as religiously insightful uh, as men? Um, the reason usually given in these churches has to do with the Bible. And, um, and so I think it's really important to understand what the Bible actually says about it, and also to see how the views of women in the Christian church developed over time. And so that's, that's been a, a source of real interest among scholarship over the last 30 or 40 years, and is one of, one of my interests as well. Um, yeah. it, is, it is very interesting, actually, because if you, and we'll, we'll get into this later, but if you look at how the very early church seemed to have functioned and then how it kind of gradually shifted as the church became more institutionalized and less less of a peripheral um, kind of fringe religion. There does seem to be a very strong correlation with the prominence of women in roles of leadership um, and, and, in, and in among the clergy. So I, I yeah I'll be I'll be interested to, well, to talk no, more about right. that. Well, that's right. As we're going to see, I mean, as the church grew and the it, as the church grew, the role of women shrank, and that's mm -hmm. not a historical accident. Yeah, no, I, I believe it. So this is, I, I think, a, a basic starting point, but a very necessary starting point for the conversation we're having. What rules and laws does the New Testament contain about the role and place of women in the church? Well, it's a very interesting thing because the um, there, the places that actually talk about what women ought to do seem to stand at odds with other places to talk about what women were doing with with approval. And so um, what what the way it works out is uh, just if you if you think about the New Testament chronologically, like you if you start with what Jesus was doing, you know, and, and in his ministry. And then you go into what Paul was happening in the churches of Paul after Jesus' death. And then what was happening after Paul. When you trace that chronologically, it looks like women um, are very active to begin with, but then as time goes on, they get less and less active, as I was indicating earlier. And most of the prescriptions about women saying what they can and cannot do come from the later side of things. And almost certainly these later writings are, are emphasizing that women should not be in leadership roles precisely because they were in leadership roles and, and some of the men writers didn't like this. <laughs> and so there, there are several passages that we could probably talk about at length, but especially uh, in, in works assigned to Paul that, that whoever's writing them claim to be Paul, but probably Paul wasn't, wasn't the author, the actual author. And so these are later writings. Where, where they're told a, that women a, need to be quiet. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really interesting thing that um, I remember a professor, I think I was still in, in undergraduate, explaining to me when you're looking at ancient laws, you're not looking at... Um, you're not looking at what people were not doing. Because if, if, for example, if no one is stealing, then you don't need a law against stealing. When you legislate something, you're legislating because people are actively doing something you want them to stop doing. So when you look at ancient laws and, and ancient law codes, you're looking at what behavior was actually happening yeah. and what people were trying to control and restrict. 
That's right. I mean, in, in the modern world, you know, we wouldn't have had laws against the use of marijuana if nobody was using marijuana. Exactly. <laughs> so why, why do you pass a law? And so if you've got rules against women being leaders, that probably tells you something. So what, what kinds of things do we see women doing in the New Testament? Well, you know, when you, it's a very, one of the very interesting questions was the, is about the role of women in the life of Jesus and himself. And we may, we may want to devote a whole, whole episode to that because there's a lot that can be said. Uh, but it, but it is very interesting that, uh, it looks like Jesus is a lot more involved with women in public than, uh, than you would expect a Jewish rabbi, uh, to be. I mean, he's got, he's got women followers, uh, they support him. They uh, financially support him. They travel with him. Uh, he publicly uh, deals with them. He talks with them. He, he teaches them in public and he, and he heals them. In I mean, there, he touches. I mean, there's, there's all these, these references to women uh, in, in the life of Jesus that makes a lot of scholars suspect that, that Jesus' message, um, Jesus' overall message was that God's kingdom was soon going to come and it would be a perfect place here on earth where there won't be any war, there won't be any illness, there won't be any prejudice, there won't be, there'll be equality and justice. And, and it may be that women were really attracted to this because uh, in the ancient world generally, not just, not just in Israel, not just in Judaism, but kind of generally, women were second rate citizens almost mm -hmm. Almost exclusive. And it looks like Jesus maybe is opening up. And then that seems to have taken off then with his early followers. When when you say that there were women following Jesus and, and donating money to his cause, were they doing this as independent actors or is it in conjunction with their husbands or fathers? So that that's the interesting thing is because usually in, in the ancient world broadly, women, uh, women were um, first uh, subject to their fathers. And then when they were, they were given in marriage to a man who then was in control and called the shots. You do have cases of women uh, who are independent, either because they have independent means or they're not married, uh, but their fathers have died, who, who, who can be independent. And there are passages in the New Testament, like uh, Luke chapter 8, that says that Jesus and his male disciples, the 12 male disciples, were being supported by three women. Uh, one of them is married to a rich person. So it's it's Luke 8, verses uh, 1 through 3. So it's uh, Joanna, Susanna, and Mary Magdalene. Uh, interestingly, by the way, uh, people don't know this bit. Uh, this is the only verse about Mary Magdalene in Jesus' public ministry. Like So from the time Jesus starts his ministry, baptism, all the way to his to the time he goes to Jerusalem, this is the one verse that ever mentions Mary Magdalene. I point I this have out. No idea. <laughs> That's because people just assume that Mary Magdalene is like one of the close ones, right? Wasn't she yeah. the closest? Weren't hey, weren't they lovers and had babies? Uh, the, the entire ministry. This one Dan first. Brown has a lot to answer for. <laughs> she, yes, Dan Brown. Yeah, thank you. That inimitable historian <laughs> that we get all our information from. But I mean, this is the one verse that Mary Magdalene is mentioned during Jesus' public ministry before his death. Um, uh, and she and Joanna Susanna helped support Jesus. For his, that's what it says. <laughs> okay. So uh, anyway, uh, it does appear that these three women were supporting uh, were supporting them. They had means. And we have other passages that talk about a group of women going with Jesus and the male disciples to Jerusalem. And who, they observe his crucifixion. And according to the tradition, of course, they find his tomb to be empty. So how, if, if we've got women supporting Jesus and going with him um, and listening to him preach, how does this compare to what we see of women's participation in Greco-Roman religion? Well, you know, it's a much, uh, it's a, it's a much studied topic and it ends up being complicated. Um, you know, the, I have a lot of people come up to me and ask, you know, what did the Romans think about this? You know, or what did the Jews think about this? And my response, you know, in the first century, what did Jews think about this? Or what, what, what happened in the, in the Greek culture at this, you know, in the fourth? And I, you know, I always feel like saying, well, you know, what do Americans think? <laughs> yeah. You know, what do Americans do? Well, it depends which American you talk to. And so it, it is complicated. So women um, throughout, throughout the history of the Greek and Roman worlds, women generally were, um, uh, were, were, um, given a place in the home, but not were given a place in public 
in, in public discussion, public politics. They weren't involved with with a war or governmental decisions. They couldn't vote. They, you know, and so, but their their sphere was the home, uh, and so uh, that was typically the situation. It was the case in Judaism uh, as well at the time. But there were there certainly were religious movements in the Greek and Roman worlds where women were prominent. Uh, there were religious pagan cults that were focused on women that only women could participate in. Women could be priestesses. Uh, women could have uh, could have authoritative roles in some in some situations. Um, and so uh, it's not that every woman was like completely oppressed. It's mm -hmm. that they they had they could have roles sometimes, uh, but those are almost always the elite women. Very rarely yes. did the non elites have those kind of privileges. Yeah, we see something similar actually in in Mesopotamian history. Um, you and this kind of feeds into one of my next questions. You get women who. Um, operate outside of what would normally be expected of them socially in roles as priestesses. And I think probably the most famous is, is Enheduanna, who was um, daughter of the Akkadian king Sargon. She is, you, you may have heard of her audience as, as the world's first named author. And she was placed in a high priestess position by her father and probably wielded a significant amount of, of political power. Uh, and if you're not thinking about priestesses, there are um, almost like orders of nuns um, called the Naditu priestesses. And, and these women lived aside from um, their families. They didn't have husbands, they didn't have children. In fact, you've, they're really interesting uh, legal records of them adopting. So el older Naditu nuns would adopt their younger um, priestesses, and they would uh, bequeath their, their goods to them as they, they had no um, yeah. natural born children. And one of the things with the Naditi priestesses, and I, I know with if you're looking at Roman history, the Vestal Virgins, the key is in the name there, a lot of this is linked to or seems to be linked to a woman's uh, sexual status, either as a virgin or as a widow. And I know that in the early churches, uh, widows had or could have um, a particular place that some men were were less than thrilled about. Would you mind talking a little bit about yeah. um, no, it's a good, their position? No, it's a good point. There, there are some close parallels there because in, um, as I was saying, you know, it, normally a woman was subject to her husband, then subject to, I mean, subject to her father, then to her husband. And in early Christianity, it's a lot of people realized there, there was also, a, there was a movement within early Christianity to push celibacy. Uh, not just uh, among men who become, you know, eventually becomes part of the priesthood in the Catholic Church, but but um, even in the days of Paul, you know, Paul thinks that it's better to remain single if you can. And in Paul's case, it's because uh, that allows you then to to spend your time promoting the gospel rather than having family family concerns. But it is interesting that women, in particular, latched on to the ascetic appeal. Uh, in, in Christianity, especially as you get on in the centuries, uh, as men take over the church, uh, many women uh, who are at least elite women uh, do, uh, do embrace a life of chastity and, and, and not getting married. And one theory behind that is why that is, is that this provided them with the kind of authority they wouldn't have otherwise because they're not, un they're not subject to a husband. And so um, the, the original reasons for celibacy within the tradition, which wasn't for everybody, but I mean, people who did become celibate and, and not married were because the kingdom was coming soon and you need to get ready for it. But when it became clear that the kingdom wasn't gonna come next Thursday, after all, they, they end up, uh, women ended up, um, some women decide, you know, if I actually, if I uh, remain single, I can have more autonomy. And, uh, and that was, you know, that was a good thing for them. So do you think then that and I, I suspect this may deserve its own episode also. So if it's a lot, we can come back to it at another point. Did women in different dom denominations have different freedoms and authorities that we maybe don't see so much coming through in like the Roman Catholic tradition? So I'm, I'm thinking specifically of Gnosticism, um, but I, I don't know if there are other, other denominations also that would be relevant. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the thing about Christianity, one of the things I'm sure we're going to be talking about a lot <laughs> on this podcast is just how diverse it was. Uh, in the early centuries. We're accustomed to being diverse today, 
uh, where you know you have Roman Catholics and Greek Orthodox and and uh, Presbyterians and Methodists and you got fundamentalists and you got you got Southern Baptists and you got Jehovah's Witnesses and you got Mormon you got all these things that call themselves Christian. It's like wow, that's different, uh, you know. And so, uh, but in the early church, it was also very very different. There were different groups who considered themselves followers of Jesus, who believed they followed his teachings. Uh, and that followed the traditions that he started, who had very, very different views of things. And there were a number of groups that um, that today scholars might call Gnostics, that you're referring to, the Gnostics. They're, they weren't just like one group of things. They're, they're like a bunch of different groups uh, that, that we might label as Gnostic. And these are people who, um, to, we'll have we'll have a number of episodes i'm sure on them but but the basic idea is that the way a person attains uh deliverance from this world that the idea you, you your spirit is trapped in this world and needs to escape your body so that you can have spiritual eternal life and the way that happens is by acquiring the secret knowledge that can bring the salvation and so the word for knowledge in greek is gnosis uh, with a G, Gnosis, and so these are called Gnostics with the G, Gnostics. Well, there are there are um, there are some ancient sources that indicate that not in Gnostic circles, women uh, could have as significant a role uh, in uh, in the religion as men, uh, and so. Uh, we have a number of Gnostic texts, for example, that celebrate Mary Magdalene, and in some of them, they show her superior superiority to Peter. <laughs> There's this kind of conflict between Mary Magdalene and Peter, which is interesting because these are the two that in the earliest tradition were individually said to have been the ones who first learned about the resurrection. Which one learned first, Peter or Mary? And then you later get these texts where uh, these Gnostic texts where Mary is shown to be superior. And part of the, part of the issue with all of this is that if you have a divine spark with you, within you, you know, if you have like an element of the divine within in you, the divine is not sex, it's not you know is not gendered. <laughs> and so, uh, if it, you're a woman or a man, you could have the same you know you could have the spark. And so, there there definitely were. Uh, there definitely were groups that uh, emphasized women uh, more than than others. And one of the things that many, many of us have long thought is that even in the tra the orthodox tradition, as you might call it, like the, the what became the, the standard view of Christianity at the very beginning, like in the ministries of ministry of Paul that early, but women, women were more dominant then as well than they became later. That's probably a good place to to start because we, we mentioned earlier that the role of women changes obviously throughout the course of church history. When we're looking at the life, well, not the life of Paul, but Paul's times, I know that he mentions women uh, in his letters as colleagues and almost co-workers. Um, what, what do we see in those letters of how women were performing, what roles they had? Um, and like, were they running churches? Were they primarily mm. financial donors? What what kinds of things are they doing? No, that's a really important question. And in part because there's a general sense today that Paul uh, was uh, quite opposed to women uh, in leadership roles and that Paul's often labeled as one of the first great misogynists. Um, and I think it's unfair uh, for reasons we'll, we'll talk about here in a minute. I, I will say, when I teach my class at Chapel Hill, I, I teach in my, in, in my New Testament class, my introduction to the New Testament. And I have, a, I have each student in this class has to participate in a formal debate on a topic they do research for. And, they, they, and I used to have the debate topic as resolved. Uh, the Apostle Paul was a misogynist. And after a while, I had to stop using that topic because I realized after the debates that some students did not know what misogynist meant. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, where do we start with this one? <laughs> okay, then. Uh, so so um, Paul's letters are a bit complicated. There are 13 letters that claim to be written by Paul in the New Testament. Uh, so there are 27 books in the New Testament, 13 claim to be written by Paul. But scholars have long maintained since the 19th century or so that, that six of these letters probably were not written by Paul. And so today, just in smug scholarship, scholars will always talk about the seven undisputed letters of Paul, where basically everybody agrees. In those seven letters, 
you get a very different view of women than you get in the other letters, the later letters that are probably not by Paul, but written by someone else later, claiming to be Paul. And for example, in Romans chapter 16, Romans is one of Paul's, is probably the most important letter for most people. Uh, you read, most people don't read chapter 16 very carefully. Paul talks, of, Paul's greeting people in the city of Rome, Christians in the church in Rome, and he greets them by name, greets like over 25 of these people by name, and a number of them are women, and it is striking. He names one woman who is a deacon in the church, uh, a minister uh, in the church, who's actually the one carrying his letter. He's given, he's given his letter to her. There are others who have churches meeting in their homes. There are others that he calls his co-workers. Uh, there are, there are, there, there's one woman that he actually calls it one of the foremost apostles. <laughs> and wow. so this, yeah, uh, in, in Romans uh, 16, 7, he, he, he greets uh, Andronicus and Junia, uh, chief among the apostles. Whoa! Uh, and so Andronicus is a, a male name. Junia, uh, Junia is a female name. And what's it's really Junia sometimes changed to a male name. Am I yeah. remembering that correctly? It's exactly. Are like, no, this can't be right. This has to be a typo. This is a dude. This is a dude. The, the English translators, like in the older translations, they changed the name from uh, Junia to Junius, U.S., which is a man's name. Unfortunately, there was no man's name Junius in the ancient world. <laughs> they, made, they made it up because they didn't understand the idea that this would be a woman who's a chief apostle. <laughs> so, uh, so apostles for Paul were people who had uh, been commissioned by Christ to spread the good news, to be missionaries, who had appeared, Christ appeared to them, and 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 so they could become missionaries. And so, and she's one of the foremost apostles. So, yeah. So in Paul's own ministry, women were really quite active in in his churches. That's remarkable, and that contrasts quite quite strongly with I, I think, as you were saying, a lot of what. People will say, Paul said about women, you've got the whole suffer not a woman to teach. Um, and I'm assuming all of that comes from the, the other letters that are claiming to be by Paul, but are not real. Well, so there are two main passages and they are uh, strikingly and interestingly different uh, in, in their significance. One, the one that's most famous is this one in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy is one of the six that scholars have long been Pretty convinced Paul did not write. In fact, it's a it's a huge it's like among critical scholars it's it's not unanimous, but it's right up there, virtually unanimous that Paul did not write First Timothy. And First Timothy chapter five, uh, Paul says that women are to be silent in the church. They're not allowed to teach. They're not allowed to exercise authority. And then he explains why, because he says that Adam was created first, then Eve. In other words, Eve was created to help Adam, not the, she, you know, she's just the helper. Uh, and it wasn't Adam who was deceived. Eve was deceived by the devil, and then he let she led her husband astray. And so what happens if you allow women to exercise authority over men? Well, bad things. They, yeah, bad things. They get duped by the devil, and then they lead the man astray. So women are dangerous because they lead men astray. And men, you know, are strong enough, they don't get led astray by the devil, apparently. So, so that's, this is like, oh man, people sometimes ask me, you know, are there any passages from the New Testament you'd like to get cut out of there? And I'm thinking, yeah, well, that's, that's definitely one that I don't think has done a lot of good over the years. There's another passage, though, that is equally important, but is very different, because it's in a letter that Paul really did write. Uh, it's one of, in one of the seven sin, 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 14, there's a passage that uh, where Paul says that women are not allowed to speak in church. If they've got any questions, they're supposed to ask their husbands at home. <laughs> and so women are not allowed. So this is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 33 and 34. The problem in this case is different from the case in 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy, it's because Paul probably didn't write the letter. But Paul did write 1 Corinthians. But... Scholars have long argued that these two verses were not originally in 1 Corinthians, and they have really good arguments for it. <laughs> uh, and even so good arguments that like, um, that well, yeah, they're really good arguments. They convince even one of the most important commentators on 1 Corinthians, who was an evangelical Christian, Gordon Fee, was insistent these verses were not in there. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. part, of it, part of it is because in Paul's church, Paul, 
three chapters earlier says that women can speak in the church. <laughs> mm -hmm. They pray and they prophesy in church. They do that out loud. Uh, and there are other things about this passage that for, it just looks like it got stuck in by a scribe mm -hmm. based on what he knew about First Timothy. And so, uh, so when you take those two passages out, you know, Paul isn't the misogynist that he seems to be. Mm -hmm. And if he's if he's greeting a deaconess in Romans, clearly there are women in in like leadership theological leadership roles that yeah. he had like no issue with. So. Yeah, I mean, and this is a time when deacons were, you know, the word deacon just means minister. And mm -hmm. so she's a minister of the church. And so um, these are the kinds of verses that people latch on to to say, look, you know, women should have leadership roles. Mm -hmm. uh, and then other ver other people say, yeah, First Timothy says no. And and so that's why you have these disputes between mm -hmm. between groups. So we, we mentioned earlier then that um, as the church progresses, as it becomes more institutionalized and less of a like just a weird cult uh, out in the sticks, you see a, a corollary decrease in women's roles. What? How does that work? What do people restrict? Like, what roles are women then restricted to if they've been deacons and been apostles and been financial donors? How does the church want them? To to behave as you go through history? So I think what ends up happening is that um, the, the church starts out as a as small groups of people. Um, Jesus' disciples started converting people, then Paul gets converted, he starts converting people, but these are small communities. Um, most people don't realize this, but we didn't have church buildings uh, for a very long time. The first, the first surviving evidence, any archeological evidence of an actual church building is not till about the year 250. So about 200 years after Paul's day. In Paul's day, the churches were just meeting in homes. And so you just meet in private homes. Uh, and uh, that's significant for this question about women. Uh, some scholars have, have argued, I think convincingly, that, that since the home was the sphere of woman's influence, that women who had groups meeting in their homes could have more, more authority. Because this is, you know, the men basically ceded the household to the women mm -hmm. and they were off doing their public thing, off voting and fighting wars and things. <laughs> um, so, so, so the church started out as, as these home meetings and women had a prominent role then. But as the church grew, they got too big for houses. They had to start meeting outside places. And one of the, one of the places they started meeting was in cemeteries because there were like big open spaces mm -hmm. and stuff. And, and, and as the church grew, uh, more men converted, obviously and men started taking over as they tend to do <laughs> and um and once the men started taking over there started being disputes that you that ver the passage in first timothy and the passage in first corinthians that was put into first corinthians by someone other than paul these are representing later views that women need to stop exercising authority by the time you get to the second century um you actually have a split within uh, communities. You have some communities that are insisting that Paul's practices and Jesus' practices are authoritative and the women are indeed supposed to have leadership roles. And you have a lot of literature written in the period by people supporting women, uh, women in leadership roles in the church. And then you have the opposite side, which is the reaction to it, of, uh, of authors saying, no, women cannot exercise any authority. And as the church grew, that side definitely won out. Uh, and so when you get to the third, fourth, fifth century, forget it. I mean, women are not, uh, in some places they are, but basically their voices are being are, are being quashed. And I, I think this has clearly led to what a lot of people see, what we referenced earlier in uh, the Roman Catholic Church and a lot of Protestant traditions where women are just officially not allowed. So all in any, influence they sway seems to be through socially accepted roles through their position as wife of the minister or leader of the the choir yeah um well, or something or, similar 
Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, even in, as as early as First Timothy, when when Paul gives uh, instructions to the bishops, bishop and bishop is the translation for the word that just means overseer, so somebody mm -hmm. who's over the church. And he he which which people do you want as a bishop? Well, it's somebody who has to be married to one wife. <laughs> so okay, okay, the woman, yeah, no, not the women. There are there are roles for women uh, that uh, that this person foresees, but they uh, but they aren't they aren't leadership roles. Interesting. When when we're looking at then modern churches, are is the role of women subjugated and debated because of? what we see in Paul and First Timothy, or because it's tr church tradition, or is it a mixture of both things? Um, I'd say uh, it's definitely a mixture of both things um, because people just aren't you know, used to it. And uh, it's never been this way before. When I was growing up, I was in the Episcopal church and we, uh, we had a new rector who decided that girls could be acolytes. And most people, oh my God, women, girls can't be acolytes. That's a boy thing. What are they doing? You know? so I'm uh, going to break in and uh, share an anecdote because when I, I'm also Episcopalian, um, or at least when I'm in the US, I'm Episcopalian. Uh, when we, we moved down from Baltimore to Southern Maryland where we live now and found the local Episcopalian church and the first Sunday Josh and I went my husband uh there was a woman leading the service and she's in in the vestments that that you expect for um for a pastor and she stood at the front and gave a wonderful sermon and was talking about her wife and it was the most wonderful experience I've ever had in a church and I just grabbed Josh's hand and squeezed it because it felt so wonderful not only to see a woman up there giving a, a wonderful sermon she was a she was a great preacher but to have a woman who was gay and openly so and know that I was in a church that affirmed both of those things it was a, it was a very special moment well it's a you know it's actually it's a very similar issue of course because right now um there are a lot more denominations accepting women as pastors, but there there's now a big split about the LGBTQ uh, situation with with pastors. The as you know, the United Methodist Church uh, just um, has just this last week has become the disunited Methodist Church because a group of, of uh, churches don't think that it's right for uh, for people who are not heterosexual to be leading churches. And um, it's a very similar phenomenon to what we had with with women and continue to have with women in a number of denominations. And, you know, your, your question is a really good one. Is it because of the Bible or is it because of tradition? And uh, I think I think ultimately it's a matter of how of how people understand themselves and the people around them, that it's that, you know, there is still, there are still a lot of um, people who are um, completely male supremacists who think that men are superior and stronger and more intelligent, more analytical, able to, you know, and to, to be leaders and don't think women are as good at those roles. I mean, look at, you know, look at major businesses or look at politics. I mean, it's pretty clear that this, and, uh, and, and, um, you know, so when they they have those views because of the environment they've been raised in, then what they do when it comes to the religion is they appeal to authorities that support their views, and they ignore authorities that don't support their views, and so they'll emphasize, you know, the passages the, in terms of the women issue. They'll emphasize the passages in First Timothy and First Corinthians, and ignore what was going on in the life of Jesus and Paul, um, and so. Uh, and with the LGBTQ thing, it's a similar thing. You, you cherry pick a verse here and there and you ignore other things. Uh, and so ultimately, when you say, is it the Bible or tradition? I, in some ways, I think the answer is neither. I think, I think these things get used as excuses to support your, your particular ideology more than, they're, than they are used kind of sensibly to try and reason out how an ancient text can be applied to the modern world. Because the reality is, no. Everybody cherry picks the Bible. Mm. The people who are back to the Bible say, look, the Bible says this, the Bible says that. They ignore about two thirds of the Bible uh, because the Bible also condemns things that they're doing in equally harsh terms, but they don't read those parts. So, you know, it's, 
it's okay to, you know, it's it's not okay for a man to lie with a man because that's that's an abomination. But, you know, I'm going to work on Saturday if I want to. I'm going to eat know, shellfish. Well, not a problem. You can eat shellfish. But, you know, in the Bible, if you work on Saturday, you're supposed to be stoned to death. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, that doesn't apply anymore. <laughs> okay, fine. That's that not relevant. It was a anymore. different time. Well, okay. Yes. Exactly. It was a different time. And so the trick of, of interpreting the Bible for today, for those who are committed to the Bible, is not simply taking it word for word and saying, you know, this now apply. You have to figure out how to translate it into a new context. And that's where the debates come. How do you translate it into a new context in a way that's sensible, that in some ways is faithful to the text, but also is realistic about our modern situation where we're not living 2,000 years ago anymore? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's probably a great place to wrap up for this discussion. We will definitely revisit this topic. I think the idea of talking about women in the life of Jesus is an excellent one because I have questions, uh, which surprises no one, I'm sure. Um, So we will take a very brief break and then we'll be back with Bart's weekly update and a brand new segment, which is called Outsmart Bart, where listeners like you try and find the limits of Bart's biblical knowledge. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. So please stick with us. I'm happy to announce that I'll be doing a live remote lecture on December 14th called Other Virgin Births in Antiquity. There are other miracle working sons of God in the ancient world, people who have abilities far beyond what the rest of us can imagine, either because they can do they can do supernatural acts of healing or because they uh, are supernaturally smart, (laughs) or they are supernaturally beautiful. Uh, These are not mere mortals. They are the result of a union between a god and a mortal. A god gets a woman pregnant, and the result is is a son of God. We hear of the supernatural birth of Hercules, the great he-man of antiquity, and of the supernatural birth of Romulus, the founder of the city of Rome and of the supernatural birth of Pythagoras, the great Greek philosopher, and the supernatural birth of Alexander the Great, the world conqueror. All of these and many others have supernatural births, but is any of them a virgin birth? That's what I'll be talking about in my lecture, Other Virgin Births of Antiquity. The lecture again will be on December 14th. It will include a a period of question and answer, for people who come. The retail price will be $14.95. We're going to be having an early bird launch special though. For anybody who wants to buy the course in advance of the lecture, it's $9.95. If you want more information about the lecture or if you want to sign up for it, please visit barterman.com slash virgin births. I hope I can see you there. Welcome back, and now it is time to catch up with all of Bart's news and excitements. This is Bart's Weekly Update, where we get to catch up on all the latest about Dr. Ehrman's book releases, speaking engagements, ehrmanblog.org happenings, and online course launches. Bart, what excitements do you have to share with us this week? Well, uh, yeah, so... uh... The main thing on my desk right now, after after you and I are done talking here, <laughs> is uh, I've got I've got two things uh, lined up for my my the thing called the Barterman and Professional Services. I'm doing an online course. I don't I think I probably mentioned this before, but uh, on December 10th and 11th on uh, on finding Moses, and so it's about the the uh, history and legends about Moses in the Old Testament. But, you know, Remind me, is that are you doing that live? I'm doing it live. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I'm doing it live. And so uh, it'll be a course that people can buy, whether they come live or not. But if they come live, they can ask questions. <laughs> and so uh, so that'll be live on December 10th and 11th. It'll be eight lectures on uh, the uh, the Old Testament dealing with, with Moses and the Jewish law and the Exodus and those sorts of things. Pretty, really interesting. Far mm-hmm. more interesting than people imagine because people get kind of bored in parts of the Old Testament. I'll tell you, this stuff is really... Oh, no, it's, it's very interesting when you start yeah. getting down into it. I love yeah. hearing about the Exodus. It's wonderful. But then since it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be Christmas soon, <laughs> as we all have noticed. I'm actually going to do a, a, a kind of one-off Christmas lecture as well uh, on um, the other virgin births in antiquity. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. 
So, so that's what Wonderful. I'm doing now. Well, it sounds like a lot of fun. And uh, now we have, as I said, our newest segment, Outsmart Bart. Dr. Ehrman has written six New York Times best-selling books and holds a PhD from Princeton. It's not often you'll see him made a fool, but it doesn't hurt to try. It's time for Outsmart Bart. But are you ready for the very first round? I have no idea if I'm ready. And this might be a very <laughs> short segment because <laughs> there may be a series of, I have no ideas. <laughs> so let's, let's see. I mean, these things, well, we people have, can look up trivia questions on the internet. It's like, oh I, God, you, and you're not allowed to Google them either. So <laughs> I know. Okay, go for it. Sorry. Uh, so today's questions come from Samuel Brewster. Samuel, thank you very much for submitting these. And um, you. Uh, we have three questions, all on um, the Bible. First question. What was the name of the boy who fell asleep listening to Paul and fell from a window? Oh, God. I, don't, I should know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, what was his name? <laughs> no, I don't know. What was his name? It begins with an E. Yeah, I know. Uh, I forget what it is. What is it? I'm going to, I'm going to mangle this icon. Uh, Eutychus? Oh, Eutychus. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. There we go. I, and that I, I should it. remember that because Eutychus is actually, it's a word that means uh, good fortune. And oh. so it means oh. good luck. And so the, 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 this is this passage where Paul, <laughs> Paul's preaching and Eutychus is in the window and he, <laughs> Paul puts him to sleep. And a lot of preachers have really liked this story because you know, they, they know the experience quite well, people falling asleep <laughs> during their sermons. But the guy falls out the window and then, then Paul goes out and raises him from the dead. And, uh, but, but there's this kind of play on words and all because the guy who's named good fortune you know falls out breaks his neck so yeah. fortune is that he, he's brought back to life again i guess yeah i do i do like that one of my favorite things about uh, looking at ancient texts is the names because especially in mesopotamia and i know various other parts of the ancient world the names actually mean something and it's it's beautiful i i, I enjoy that very much uh okay sorry uh Brief discourses there. Uh, what body part did Simon Peter cut off of the high priest's slave in the book? Uh, well, there's only one body part, and it was the ear. Uh, and it's in only one of the Gospels. And um, many people have wondered, how did that happen exactly? I mean, how do you take a sword and lop off an ear? And, like, that's the only thing that you, I mean, don't you, like, doesn't the guy get killed? I, mean, don't you, like, I wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's quite skillful. And then, uh, and then Jesus, of course, it reattaches it. And uh, one of the reasons it's an interesting passage is because um, it's this passage where Jesus says, uh, "Let the one uh, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword." And I think Jesus probably did say something like that. That, and he's. He, I think Jesus was a pacifist. He believed in nonviolence, and he's saying, "Look, if you pick up the sword, you're going to die by the sword." And I think, I think this is the kind of uh, I think this is the kind of passage that I think the story, I think the narrative of the disciples being armed and fighting arose out of the saying of Jesus. You see what I mean? Jesus mm -hmm. probably said this at some point and somebody came up with a story to set it in a context. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And we have one final question for this segment. Uh, <laughs> this, this might be tricky i don't know um fill in the blanks peter an apostle of jesus christ to the exiles of the dispersion in blank 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 and blank okay that's beginning of first peter um peter, uh, okay pontus galatia cappadocia asia and bithynia that yes the right order is that the right order no that's the right words in the right order oh my god really <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, when I was at, when I was at uh, Moody Bible Institute, I memorized First Peter <laughs> among other <laughs> books. So, just, for fun. <laughs> just for fun. Is it, actually, the reason I memorize I started memorizing books is because uh, kind of a strange reason. And of course, people back then, my my Bible school thought you should memorize the Bible because it's the sacred scripture. But also, I I had come to think that the 
the the mind is not something that gets too filled up, but that the more you use it, the more it expands. <laughs> and so I thought if I mem the more things I memorize, the more room I'll have for other things. And so I started memorizing books of the Bible. <laughs> but it's been, I think it's been it's been over forty years since I recited First Peter to myself. <laughs> well, I mean, I got the first verse. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bart, you got two out of three right, which means Samuel did indeed outsmart you. So, congratulations, Samuel. Um, well, and if kind other of, people, so it, it kind of depends, though. You know, if I were taking this as a as a undergraduate class, I'd have a sixty six percent, which would be an F. <laughs> but if I were playing in baseball in the major leagues, I'd be batting six sixty six, and man, I'd be an all star. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Well, I enjoyed that. Okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't, don't know about you, but I enjoyed that. Hopefully the audience enjoyed it too. Um, and if the audience has questions for you, they can submit them as the little intro said at bartoma.com forward slash ask Bart. So please do keep those questions coming in. We will have another Q&A session uh, next week with, with more general questions. Um, but before we finish for the week, would you mind just giving a quick summary of what we talked about and let people know if there are resources that they can check out to find out more? Yeah, so th this is, a, I think, one of the most pressing modern issues is the role of women in, uh, it, it, not just in the Bible, but in the churches, but even for those who aren't, I mean, the role of women in society. I mean, you, yeah. uh, you know, you talk about a glass ceiling, it is there. And, um, you know, why is it there? Uh, and in part, it's because of the tradition we come out of. And one of the one of the things scholars have long argued, which we were talking about here, is that in Christianity, it appears that there was a movement to allow women to have more leadership roles early on. Uh, and in the life of Jesus and in the churches of Paul, for example, but that eventually um, those uh, those attempts um, got uh, got shoved aside and uh, women were no longer given significant roles. And I think it's a very important question historically, and there's a lot to it, as you were suggesting, there's a lot to it that we haven't covered that we'll, we'll want to cover in, in later things. But the mm -hmm. basic thing is that, you know, that maybe that these commands for women to be silent are not the last word in the Bible, but maybe they're in fact just a late word. Thank you very much. Audience, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please remember to subscribe to the podcast and make sure you don't miss future episodes. Remember also that you can use the code NJPODCAST for a discount on all of Bart's courses over at www.bartermann.com. And Misquoting Jesus will be back next week. Uh, Bart, what are we going to be talking about next time? Uh, well, next week we're going to be talking about, the, uh, about a movement within Judaism called apocalypticism. Uh, apocalypticism was one of the most important um, theological and ideological uh, movements within Judaism for understanding the entire New Testament, the historical Jesus and Paul. So we'll be talking about where, what this thing is and where it came from. I'm really excited because apocalypticism gave us the book of Revelation, which is <laughs> bizarre and glorious in its bizarrity. So we will have a lot of fun. Um, thank you, everyone, again for joining us and goodbye. This has been an episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday, so please be sure to subscribe to our show for free on your favourite podcast listening app or on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel so you don't miss out. From Bart Ehrman and myself, Megan Lewis, thank you for joining us. <laughs>